good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world today. What we are going to be talking on a spoonful of history is Chapter 3, the Articles of Confederation and the Constitutional Convention. First of all, I want you guys to recap that when we left off in our last chapter, we had won the American Revolution. Remember, the Articles of Confederation, um, the Congress actually was set up to help fight and organize the war, and it was basically a loose friendship of, 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 of states. They were just a partnership, a brotherhood, but there was no local centralized government to really hold them together. And during the war, when we had a common enemy, that worked. However, after the war, old jealousies, rivalries, dislikes um, come about and cause a whole host of problems between the different states. And because there isn't a central government that's strong enough to make them get along and, and make decisions that they can enforce, problems begin to develop. In the first 10 years of our new republic, we're in grave danger of not seeing another 10 years. So that will eventually lead to the Constitutional Convention. So, the ideals of the Declaration, uh, or sorry, the ideals of the Articles of Confederation is roughly based upon the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, that we are all endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Remember, Jefferson changed happiness um, from um, property. And when Jefferson and others of that time period referred to the idea of happiness, it was a much different word than what we view happiness as now. We live in a more of a romantic age where happiness is more of a feeling, a gut instinct. Um, it was more of a rational age of um, reason type of thing where one would be able to pursue their own pursuits and, and desires and read and practice their own religion and speak their mind without being persecuted, be able to succeed or fail on their own merits. Um, with this, they um, did have a unicameral or a one-house legislature, um, and that main job was to basically make laws. Um, every state had one representative or one vote, I should say, in this unicameral legislature, and they were all equal. And to uh, have any kind of normal law passed, you needed a two-thirds vote, which means nine out of the 13 had to vote yes for something to pass. However, because of the jealousies or rivalries um, and competition between states, especially regions, it made it incredibly difficult to get any kind of law passed. To actually change the Constitution or to amend it, make any official change, it took all 13 unanimous um, consent to change. So most of the energy after the Revolutionary War went into the individual states because our founding fathers, in fact, really all the way up into the modern era, that our, um, our founding fathers and politicians and people of the time really viewed themselves as citizens of individual states first and the United States second, and that your life would basically begin and, and everything in between basically be revolve around the state and the state would have the most power so it was only common sense that those people would lead the Revolutionary War and those delegates that will eventually come and design the Constitutional Convention will go back to their individual states and create their strong state constitutions and governments um, and with that they created a state legislature or a uh, Congress which um, most of them based upon the idea of the English Parliament had two houses in which you have one house that is exercises the will of the people and the other house the will of the state so that it balances each other out to prevent tyranny. Um, the lower house, usually the House of Representatives, um, or like in California, we're called the State Assembly, um, they are elected by the American people and they make up the, the, the gentry the landed um, middle class of the American uh, frontier or the American um, um, states. Then you have a chief executive, a governor, um, in this case, that is there to enforce and carry out the will of Congress. And because 
our founding fathers were so worried about tyranny, what they designed is a, an incredibly weak chief executive that was incredibly limited, remember, based upon that idea of the Magna Carta limited power. And, the, um, and then the last branch of government is the courts, the judicial system, which interpreted law, interpreted the Constitution, and settled disputes um, within the state, not between states, but people within the individual state. So, under the earliest state constitutions, each state government was divided into what branches? And the correct answer, hopefully, would be, you would get is B, executive, legislative, and judicial. Rights embodied in early state constitutions could be what? Taken away by Congress, traced back to Thomas Hobbes, seen in the Three-Fifths Compromise, or traced back to the English Bill of Rights? And the correct answer is, hopefully you got it, D. So the Articles of Confederation. It is our first government of the United States, um, and it was created during the American Revolution. And like I said, it was a unicameral legislature, a one-house legislature, and every state had one vote. And so to pass any kind of law, remember, it needed a two-thirds vote. You're going to need to know this for a test. A two-thirds vote, nine out of the 13 states. So it made it incredibly difficult to pass. They did have certain um, ability to do certain things. So the government, the central government, the Articles of Confederation could deal with other countries, create treaties with other countries. However, our nation between North and South were so divided over who should we align with where the New England and Northern states wanted to align themselves and, and basically have a treaty with England and um, the Southern states wanted with France. So we, they couldn't even agree upon that. So many treaties would never get ratified or approved leading to economic turmoil, political unrest, insecurity, uh, and no country in the world would want to deal with us because we couldn't agree upon anything. Um, we also had the ability to have an army. They could not have a permanent standing army. Our founding fathers were greatly worried about that and thought that it would lead to tyranny. So they could only ask individual states for to lend them their state militias for an army. And they could also print money. However, because there was no way of raising money and, um, and paying off our debts, there was our, our national treasury was so depleted that really the m value of money wasn't really standardized as well as um, had very much value. So that led individual states to really kind of create their own currency and their own money. Now, what they could not do was enforce law. So, if the state legis, if the federal legislature, the House of Rep uh, the Articles of Confederation Congress was actually able to pass a law, they couldn't enforce it. They could only ask individual states to follow that law. There was nothing to force them to follow it. They were not also prohibited to tax. Remember, they believed that if you forced an individual state to pay a tax that they did not like or did not think was uh, a valid tax that obviously really harkens back to the English and so they weren't able to tax they could only ask states for money so really as I said in the class it's like you turning 16 and your parents giving you a brand new car and you go to turn on that car and it doesn't start because there's no engine in the car basically they just gave you a really nice you know um, driveway warmer. It, 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 there's really nothing good. So our founding fathers were b being very reactionary in creating this government because they wanted, they did not want it to lead to tyranny. But in so doing, what they actually did was create a different kind of tyranny. The one good thing that actually does come about out of the Articles Confederation Congress is the Northwest Ordinance. After the American Revolution, this whole area in here, this whole area in here basically was, I'm um, sorry, this whole area in here basically was open territory given to us by the Treaty of Paris that ended the American Revolution, right? So Americans encouraged settlement in, the, in here um, because there's really no opportunity for regular people, all that land is taken, 
So people begin to flock and move into this area, into the Northwest Territory, presumably called Northwest Territory because it's northwest of Virginia, okay? But you have to realize there are people living there. That would be the Native American Indians, which would cause a whole host of problems. Now, the brilliant stroke is that the Articles of Confederation sold off land um, to basically raise money to help pay for the war debts as well as to keep our government functioning. And this was the one successful thing because what it did was set up a, a the rules on how a territory would become a state that once you have um, a certain amount of people within a state that you could organize a legislature. Once you have 60,000 people within that territory, you have a government, a post office, schools, you can apply to be a state and apply to come into the union and at this period of time you will quickly see that you will have Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin that will come in very quickly. Virginia, um, uh, Kentucky will be taken um, out of parts of Virginia here. Um, you would also have Mississippi and Alabama, um, sorry, um, Mississippi and Alabama that will also come into the union um, because of the, um, the Northwest Ordinance policy of organizing these territories into states. And like I said, that's really the only success story out of the Articles of Confederation. So, how did the U.S. national government raise money? It would be D, both B and C. After the American Revolution, most states did what? It would be D, took steps to eliminate the importation of slaves. The first Constitution of the United States of America was, I hope you guys get this, B, Articles of Confederation. Why did the Articles of Confederation set up a Congress? Basically, A, to deal with limited national concerns. So, after about eight or nine years, most people knew what was going on was not going to work and that if we um, and because the English were still in Canada along the Great Lakes and the forts that we may have won the first war of independence but we we're going to lose the next war and everything and we barely won that war so there were a lot of people that were very eager to really try to fix the Articles of Confederation to convince states to give up a certain amount of their power and to give it to a centralized authority, a, a centralized power, so that our country could survive. However, people were still worried that this was going to lead to tyranny. Um, and in Annapolis, Maryland, they will have a convention. About nine out of the 13 states are going to show up. And really nothing happens of note other than saying, hey, next year, let's meet in, in Philadelphia to really discuss how to fix the Articles of Confederation. So for that year, James Madison and others are writing all these um, leading men of, of the 13 states trying to convince them to come to Philadelphia and in fact James Madison is telling everybody that George Washington's coming and that really kind of convinces a lot of people that didn't want to go to actually come to the convention the only problem was George Washington kept saying no that he was uh, a farmer now he was retired he wanted nothing to do with public life until Shays Rebellion now, what happened in Shays' Rebellion is this. Because of the inability of Congress to regulate commerce and to, to settle disputes between states and negotiate successful treaties, um, there led to be an economic depression. And with this, there were a lot of farmers, mainly the farmers in all over the country, but uh, for Shays' Rebellion, the farmers began to lose their land in western Massachusetts. And these farmers, many of them Revolutionary War veterans and heroes, were promised a pension. But remember, the Articles of Confederation Congress is not able to, to really tax and be able to give these, um, these war heroes a pension. So there, there's no money there. But also because of the economic depression and because there's no favorable trade with other countries, the crops are rotting in the ground. The farmers have no way of paying their mortgages on their farms, so the uh, bank begins to foreclose. Daniel Shea and the Shaysites 
um, a group of angry farmers and Revolutionary War veterans uh, basically rise up, rebel, and attack and burn down a courthouse in Massachusetts. Now, this panics the governor of Massachusetts, and he will quickly write a message to the president of the Articles of Confederation Congress asking for him to send troops to help put down this rebellion. The only problem is there the Articles of Confederation president really does not have the authority to be able to do that. So he kind of sends back going, you know, my deepest sympathies, I hope it works out for you. Uh, luckily, it does. The, um, the rebellion is put down. Um, but what it really does is it shows George Washington and others that if a bunch of angry farmers can rise up and rebel and threaten the safety and security of our republic, What's going to happen next if the English do it? So George Washington changes his mind and actually um, shows up to Philadelphia and, um, and will very quickly be unanimously elected the president of the new Constitutional Convention. So depression after the Revolutionary War caused a depreciation of currency, reduction in trade, inability of Congress to raise taxes, or D, all of the above? The answer is D. What caused Shays' Rebellion? Land in the Northwest Territory was sold, cruel treatment of slaves, farmers were angry about their rising debt, abolitionists demanded an end to slavery. The correct answer would be C. Shays' Rebellion resulted in increased support for revising the Articles of Confederation. B. Okay, so with that said, we have this constitutional convention. 12 out of the 13 states are going to arrive. Rhode Island is the loner that does not come to the convention. But remember, under the Articles of Confederation, um, the mandate is that all 13 have to vote to say yes to change the Constitution. So, obviously, if Rhode Island doesn't show up, they're not going to change the Constitution. And that was the main goal why they met. So Hamilton and others realized that, hey, we're never going to be able to get this group together again. Let's vote. Uh, let's stay here in, and have secret deliberations and try to rewrite the whole entire thing and see where it goes. And like I said, they will quickly elect George Washington, leader of the convention. He will not say much. He's not a man of many words. He's not a a public speaker, nor is he an original thinker, but he his talent and his genius really was that he was a leader, and he inspired men to do great things. So he was the perfect candidate to be the president of the convention, and at the very end, what they wound up doing is creating a whole brand new constitution, the one that we have now. So some of the major players of the um, convention, like I said before, is George Washington, who becomes the president of the convention. We also have Roger Sherman. Roger Sherman, remember in class I called him the Hannah Montana of the convention, that basically he comes up with the great compromise, creating a bicameral legislature and that we could have the best of both worlds. One house based upon one plan, uh, which is equal representation, and another house based on a different plan, which is based upon proportional representation. And that's exactly the model of what we have now. You have Governor Morris. And he is um, a great writer, um, and he wrote the final draft of the Constitution. Then you have James Madison, little Jemmy, um, all five foot two, one hundred pounds of him. He is the father of our Constitution because he sat up front every day, wrote. Um, copious notes went back and transcribed them into longhand and pretty much what we know happened what we know happened in the convention is because of him and because of that he is known as the father of the Constitution he is also one of the co-authors of the Federalist Papers along with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay these three men um, wrote under the pseudonym or the fake name Publius after a Greek 
philosopher and um, political thinker um, of antiquity, and they wrote these series of newspaper articles published in newspapers around the 13 states to ease people's concerns and to convince them um, that there are checks and balances in this new constitution to prevent tyranny, because that was a big worry. So who is called the father of our Constitution? Hopefully you guys got it. James Madison. Who wrote the final draft? Hopefully you guys got that. Mr. Pegleg, Governor Morris, or I'm sorry, Governor Morris. Now the three-fifths compromise. Uh, this is really important because this also comes about during the Articles of Confederation and a lot of people really look at this as a disgrace in or as a racist thing. And it really, it is a, in, in, in one sense racist, but in another sense it's also a product of their time. You really can't judge a previous generation from the guise or the view of our generation. And uh, as I said in class, remember the three-fifths compromise really isn't about the institution of slavery. What it is about is population count to determine how many representatives are in the House of Representatives. Um, because most of the population lived in the northern states, southern states um, were very worried that they would be overpowered by northern states in the House of Representatives and that they would quickly want to end the institution of slavery as well as bully the South. So the South wanted to count their slaves in the population count because in some states like Georgia, slaves outnumbered white people. Okay, So they wanted to count the slaves. But the northern um, delegates did not like this. They thought you uh, it would be wrong because you're counting property. And so the compromise was for every five slaves you can count them as three white people in your population count to determine the representation in the House of Representatives. What's really, really important about the Three-Fifths Compromise is because of the Three-Fifths Compromise, the South is actually going to have more representatives in the House of Representatives than they really should, allowing a tie to be broken um, in the 1800 election, making Thomas Jefferson the third president of the United States. And if it wasn't for the Three-Fifths Compromise, Aaron Burr would have been the third president of the United States, who went on to note... Um, as vice president to Thomas Jefferson sh um, fights a duel with Alexander Hamilton and shoots and kills Alexander Hamilton and becomes a fugitive. So the two different plans, the two different plans the two different plans um, for Congress is the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. Okay. The Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan are the two different plans that came up. The Virginia Plan is sponsored and came up from the um, big states that had larger populations. And Virginia put forth this plan and said that they wanted to create a legislature. This is just for the legislature, okay, not for the president or the judicial um, court system. This is um, based upon how are we going to determine how many representatives each state gets. Virginia thought hey, you know what, we like Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, we have more people, we pay more taxes, we contribute more to the economy, um, so therefore we should have more say in Congress, so therefore we should have more representatives, so therefore it should be proportional to the population of the state. If our state has more people in it, we should have more representatives. This favored the large states. However, New Jersey and Delaware and the other states did not like this because they figured they would never be heard over the shouts of, of the bigger states. So they favored a legislative branch much like that of the Articles of Confederation where everybody is equal. That no matter how big or small population-wise your state is, everyone gets the same vote. This favors the small states. Well, there is a big argument. A lot of people actually um, are threatening to leave the, and just when it's just getting started, they uh, everything almost is going to break apart. Um, 
Benjamin Franklin in his time in this time of need uses his wit and and um, humor and he uh, and charisma to rally people together. He even said that, hey, I think we should start off the morning by uh, by um, morning prayer to try to unite people and to calm um, to calm everything. So the Virginia plan called for a what a um, it should be proportional representation. So. What happened is this guy here, Roger Sherman, remember the Hannah Montana of the convention, what he does is he comes up with the Great Compromise and he says, hey guys, we can have the best of both worlds. Let's create a Congress, a legislative branch made up of two houses. The first house is called the Senate and that would be based upon the New Jersey plan that all states get two, okay, regardless of population. The other is going to be called the House of Representatives, and that house will basically be elected by the American people, made up of the American people, just like the House of Commons in the Parliament in England, and it's going to be based upon population. Now, that three-fifths compromise, this is where it applies to this is the House of Representatives. And so, and to get anything done, to get any kind of legislation passed, both the will of the many and the will of the few have to agree. Um, and that is called the Great Compromise. And that is exactly how our United States Congress works today. You have the Senate and the House. Both of them have two different um, responsibilities. And um, they have, they're, they're made up, the dynamic and the personality are very different of the two. but. It balances the will of the many, the people, with the will of the few, which is the Senate. They look after the interest of the state and the country. They look after the interest of the people. The Great Compromise resolved the problem of what? Slavery, adding the Bill of Rights, ratifying the new Constitution, state representation in Congress. It would be deep state representation. Blank legislatures are divided into two houses. Confederated, sovereign, bicameral, or popular sovereignty. It would be C, bicameral. As a result of the weakness of the Articles of Confederation government, debts um, rose, states often fought among themselves, the British occupied strategic forts in the Great Lakes, or is it D, all of the above? The answer would be D, all of the above. Three-fifths compromise addressed the problem of... C, how to include enslaved people in population counts. So this new plan of government is really based upon enlightenment um, and age of reason ideals as well as ancient antiquity. The idea of democracy is popularized and comes from the Greeks, but even Plato and Socrates thought that democracy was the worst form of government because basically it's mob rules. So our founding fathers understood that this idea of democracy is a beautiful concept, but how, but really it's not workable in a country to have a pure democracy because it's going to be like a mob, an angry rioting mob. It's going to lead to tyranny. So what they figured is how do we balance that in a lot, uh, to prevent it from leading to tyranny? So they will basically design a Republican democracy based upon the ideas of the Greeks and the Romans creating a Democ a, a republic in which we as the American people are going to elect representatives to represent us and then from there they are going to um, they are going to represent our will through the idea of popular sovereignty, the will of the people. And if they do a good job, they stay. If they don't, we boot them out. So this also we, they look back to the idea of the English Parliament and this idea of the citizen participation going back to the glorious revolution of England where the English booted out a king, brought in a new king, and then basically said, hey, you're going to live by these rules and you're going to participate. And because the English wanted to make sure that the middle class who paid the taxes are happy, they gave them a place at the table creating the House of Commons. The Magna Carta, they wanted to make sure that if they had a chief executive, a president, that that president would be incredibly weak, incredibly limited. Our founding fathers would probably roll over in their graves if they realized and knew just how 
powerful the President of the United States has actually become. They never intended the President to become that powerful. The real power is supposed to be held in the House of Representatives, which really uh, uh, is the only federal government that is actually directly elected by the American people. They also believe that government's sole purpose is to protect people's individual rights. So they made sure that they wanted to have a Bill of Rights included. And all of this is based upon John Locke and the idea of natural rights that we are all endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable or God-given rights that among these are life, liberty. John Locke said pursuit of property, but remember Jefferson changes that to happiness. So the idea that all people have natural rights could be traced back to John Locke. The framers of the Constitution drew on what Enlightenment idea? It would be the natural rights and balance of power. So, federalism. To basically convince our, our the states that it would be okay for them to give up a certain amount of power, invest that power into a centralized government that they're not in control of, and that it wouldn't lead to tyranny, they came up with this idea of federalism. Remember, it's the shared power between the state and the federal government in which both have to work together but also compete with one another to balance each other out to prevent any one institution to become too powerful, preventing tyranny. But someone has to be in control. Just like in the military, someone has to call the shots. Someone has to be in control. Others have to follow the, the rules of engagement. And so they, they realized that the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. And states cannot go against the Constitution. Um, if you look back in history, when Arkansas went against these, um, the integration of public schools. The federal government sent in troops to force integrate. When you look at immigration laws, federal drug laws, states do not have the power to override or ignore. However, they do, and that is a constitutional question of why. If you ask certain states, they say it's to send a test balloon to the, the court system to challenge the Constitution through due process and hopefully change it through that regard. And remember, nothing can go against the Constitution. So, the Constitution created a federal system of government in which the national power has all the power. The power is divided between the national and the state. States have all the power. The legislative branch is made up of one house. The correct answer would be B. The sharing of power between the federal and the state government is C, federalism. Under the Constitution, concurrent powers are A, shared by the state and the federal government. So the three branches of government, Montesquieu, a French philosopher, said that a republic is the best form of government and to, to prevent any form of government from becoming tyrannical, you need to you should divide it up into three separate parts that have their own jobs and responsibilities, but part of their job and responsibility is to be able to cancel each other out. So that's exactly what our founding fathers did. They created three branches of government. The first branch is the executive branch or the president. And the president basically his main job is to enforce the laws, carry out the will of Congress, and to look after the safety and integrity of the American people. Okay, it was really not seen to be, it was supposed to be a political office per se, um, as it is now, but as, as really the first among many as Americans to look out and to carry out the will of Congress, okay? Um, but it has grown to be very, very different. Then you have the legislative branch, which is the only branch of government in the federal branch that actually is elected directly by the American people. And their job is to make laws, pass taxes, and do the things that um, are integral to daily life to keep our country running. And then the last branch of government is the judicial branch, which their main job is to interpret laws, to, um, to judge the Constitution, and look at the Constitution, and be able to um, interpret it. And they're the only branch that actually can do that. So in order to prevent any one single group of, from gaining too much power, the framers did what? 
divided the federal government into three branches of government, okay? So, checks and balances. With this, each, like I said before, the three branches of government are broken up, uh, or the branches of uh, the government is broken up into three branches, the president, the legislative, and the judicial, and each one of them have their own jobs, but part of their job is to be able to cancel each other out so that no one branch becomes too powerful. So the president's big um, tool in his tool chest is the veto, that anything that Congress does he can actually veto it or cancel it out and say no. However, because they want to make sure that the president is weak and doesn't lead to tyranny, the Congress actually has a lot of power. If the president says no to a law, they can just say, sorry, we're overriding it by a two-thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. So if two-thirds of 535 people say yes, they can make that law a law over the president's veto. They also, if the president misbehaves or does something unconstitutional, they can get rid of him through impeachment. And anything the president does, treaties, ambassadors, political appointments, they have to be approved by the Congress. Next, the president's check on this federal court system is he nominates those judges. We saw that play out a couple weeks ago. Okay, so. How does the judicial branch check the executive branch? Well, the same way they check the legislative branch, and it's through this idea of judicial review set up by the Supreme Court case Marbury versus Madison, in which um, the Supreme Court can look into what is going on in the, um, the executive branch and the legislative branch, and if they're doing something that they believe is unconstitutional, they can tell them to stop. And that is, this is, a big big thing because this will change really kind of the Constitution in a way and we'll talk a lot more about this when we get into Article 3 of the Constitution um, it makes the judicial branch a co-equal to the other two branches of government where before the judicial branch was almost kind of like a referee that really didn't partake in the game the judicial review allows them to kind of partake in the game now how does the um, what is the legislative branches check on the judicial branch well they can impeach them if they misbehave because remember if you're a federal court judge if you are confirmed you're there for the rest of your life so there's got to be a way to get rid of them if they're off the rocker or they're doing something wrong secondly the senate has to approve these guys or girls okay so those are the checks and balances last but not least you have the two different groups that um, debated over the ratification of the Constitution. And at first you have the Federalists, which are those that supported this new Constitution. And their main leaders were James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. Remember, they wrote the Federalist Papers, which were a, um, a series of newspaper articles published in um, newspapers trying to convince delegates to ratify this new Constitution in their state legislatures. Okay. The other group are the anti-federalist, anti-meaning against. These guys are against the new constitution. And one of their biggest complaints was that this new constitution did not have a Bill of Rights. To the federalist credit, they basically said, why do you need a Bill of Rights? Every state has their own Bill of Rights. And um, you are a citizen of that state. And really, the federal government's only going to be very small and do a handful of things like coin money, conduct foreign relations, deliver the mail, um, conduct war and peace, that type of thing. Um, it's not going to be any bigger than that. Your life is going to be centered around your state, and your state already has a Bill of Rights. But the Anti-Federalists, almost like they were looking at a crystal ball, said, you know what? We still do not feel comfortable if there isn't a Bill of Rights. What happens in a generation or two if that federal government actually does grow more powerful What's to prevent them from saying, if there isn't a Bill of Rights written, to say that you never had those to begin with and those rights are gone? So part of the agreement was that if those anti-federalists would support this new constitution and ratify this new constitution, a Bill of Rights would be added. And that is the first 10 amendments to our constitution. James Madison um, will make sure within the first two years of our republic, the one that we have now under our con this current constitution, that this Bill of Rights would be added, and that's exactly what happened. Thank you guys for listening. I know this was a really, really long lecture, and I apologize before I would have broken it up into two different lectures. Um, as we get into Chapter 4, 
Um, we are going to basically break it up into about five, maybe six different lectures. Uh, one on the legislative branch, Article 1. One on the executive branch, Article 2. One on the judicial branch, Article 3. And then we'll talk about Articles 4 through 7 and the first 10 amendments to the Bill of Rights. Uh, until next time, I hope you enjoyed A Spoonful of History and have a good day, guys.